Hello, welcome to this episode of Challenge TV. I'm Johnny Hunter. Today we're going to be discussing the ongoing protests against the murder of African-American man George Floyd in Minneapolis in the United States. George Floyd's murder, which was recorded in full on a camera phone, has led to widespread protests across the United States against systemic racism and institutionalised police violence. Our guest today is Michael Lynch, who's a member of the Organising Committee of the Young Communist League of the United States of America, the sister organisation of YCL Britain. Michael, thanks for being with us here today. And my first question would be, what's led to these protests in the United States? Well, thank you very much for having me. You know, it's been a lot of fun getting to know you just now and um, Robin uh, when I was in Venezuela with him and Pierre in Cyprus. And so uh, we really, you know, look forward um, to working uh, closely with our, with our comrades in Britain. Um, but here in the United States, yes, you know, we found ourselves in the midst of a lockdown, a quarantine as a result of the coronavirus pandemic um, about so a little bit more than two months ago. It started on March 11th, where I was living in New York City. Um, and so, you know, little by little over the past, really, I'd say 10 years over the past decade, we've seen not an increase in uh, racist killings, you know, of uh, police officers against African Americans, but they've been recorded. It's not that there's more racism now, it's just that it's being filmed. So it's very important to remember. And so it's kind of been an escalation, escalation, escalation of these events. I mean, you can think of many, uh, Tamir Rice, uh, Trayvon Martin, um, Eric Garner, you know, the first guy who said he couldn't breathe. This is accumulation of events over the past decade. And um, every time that, you know, this has happened, really there has been a more, there's been more demands. And so I remember back to Trayvon Martin, um, goodness, it was almost a decade ago. I can't believe it. But, um, uh, you know, the, we were demanding, not we as a party, you know, the Communist Party or the Young Communist League, but, you know, as a, a wider movement against police violence and racism, we were demanding the police officers to wear body cameras. And that was pretty much fulfilled. All police officers, uh, most police departments have fulfilled that uh, requirement now. But as, you know, time has passed and there's more and more killings, we as a people, as an American people, overwhelmingly now realize it's not the fact that these people, these individual police officers are bad. It's that the institution they work for is corrupt, it's racist, it's built upon slave catchers, and you know, this that goes all the way back to colonialism, you know, and it's about putting workers in their place, putting people of color in their place. And so now that more and more people realize that, and you have something like uh, what, which, what happened with George Floyd early last week, it's an explosion. It doesn't matter if we're in a pandemic or not. People say, okay, this guy, he had nine, this police officer had nine charges against him already. This was the 10th time he made a mistake, 10th, right? And he hasn't been fired. Now he has. And it was because it was recorded. And, you know, he had his knee on the guy's neck for almost nine minutes. I believe it was eight minutes and 46 seconds exactly. Um, and it went viral, right? Now, the problem is we think of he had nine, you know, charges against him before, complaints against him. How many times that are not documented has he used the same tactic to take down, you know, a victim? That's what's scary, right? And so we understand that this is, as you mentioned in your introduction, a systematic problem. It's a problem with the institution, right? And that's why all of a sudden, you know, I don't know if it's people are also say that it's uh, because we were all bored in quarantine. We were really anxious and we just wanted to go out and, you know, destroy stuff. I don't know if that's true, but um, we definitely, you know, we're fed up. We're fed up with the institution of police. And that's why this movement and these protests are sparking right now. Very interesting. I suppose uh, my next question would be uh, spread the protests have been um, across the United States. Uh, I would assume it varies quite a lot state to state. Um, if we could have some background on that, I think that would be very interesting to uh, observers in Britain. So, yeah, um, I live in New York right now, right? So that's where one of the big protests are. But the reason why this is a mass movement is that it's not just taking place where there are like strongholds of the Communist Party or, or um, like kind of Bernie Sanders, like, you know, so radical social Democrats. It's more than that. Like right now, yeah, I drove, yesterday I drove to Ohio, which is kind of a smaller rural state, right, where I'm originally from. 
And just here in town today, I went to the grocery store and there was a protest in this tiny little town. You know, like it's, and there's a university here, but it's abandoned, of course, because no one's, it's the summertime and everyone was gone because of the pandemic. But even then in this abandoned little town, you have everyone surrounding the, the city, uh, uh, the town hall, we call it, and they have their signs, you know, so it's really, this is a um, revolutionary moment we're living. It's maybe not a moment um, for socialism. You know, the, the majority of these people in these protests aren't demanding, you know, socialism, but they are demanding, as I said, a new form of policing, if you will, right? A, this institution isn't working. We need to replace it with something more democratic, community controlled, and so on. And yes, yeah, so it's taking place from New York, um, Chicago. We have comrades on the ground, Chicago, New York, um, North Carolina, in the south which is huge you know this is huge it's happening in the south also um los angeles nashville uh you've seen statues been uh come down you know uh, sometimes by accident like with the statue of louis the 16th and sometimes on purpose um city halls and government buildings have been burned down right and it's really important to understand that this is not although the overall idea and motivation for this is unified right you know we have to change the institution of police there's many different groups of people involved mm -hmm. everywhere from you know liberals and progressives to you know communists anarchists obviously um so it's it's a very broad movement right and that's a good thing that's a good thing even though there are some problems with violence and you know um uh, it's a good thing because we need to keep up this kind of broad popular front mentality uh for when the elections come in november because that's how we're going to be able to defeat uh, the extreme right which under which this police institution, which is built on racism, it thrives. I'm not saying, you know, it's not absent during um, when the Democrats are in power, of course. You know, uh, Trayvon Martin was killed when Obama was in office. But the point is, is that when someone in power like Trump is putting on Twitter all day, you know, that motivates the everyday racist to think, this is fine, the government's on my side. If Trump can say it, why can I not say it? Why can I not do it, right? And so a defeat of Trump would be a victory. It would be um, kind of uh, providing a more level playing field mm -hmm. for us to you know, fight for socialism on. Because right now it's like we're living in Nazi Germany. I mean, you see the videos and it's just awful right now. And then today, of course, you, you understand that he proclaimed that all uh, people who are anti-fascist Antifa, because Antifa is a movement. It is not a organization, right? And yeah, there's, you know, if the average Antifa person may identify as an anarchist, but in Trump's, you know, perspective, it's anyone who is anti-fascist, right? Mm -hmm. So if he is against anti-fascism, he's a fascist, right? That's the only, I mean, I don't, it's pretty obvious. And it's scary too, because then, you know, you know the poem, you know, first they came for the communists and then they came for the trade unionists. Yeah. And so we'll see what's going to happen. Yeah, that's uh, certainly a high stakes uh, thing, as you alluded to. And um, you'd, you'd mentioned one of the the, the core demands of the the movement of the front that you think is forming just now um, is in relation to policing. Um, so what what has the response of the current um, police force been? Obviously, that might have varied across the USA, but. If you could give us an insight into how, how police forces have reacted to these protests. Well, so there's always a state police force. It's, you know, we have 50 states. So there's 50 state police forces and then there's the local police, you know, for city, town, whatever. Um, and different police forces have acted in different, reacted in different ways. I can speak for today uh, in the town of Athens here in Ohio. There was no police presence at all at the protest um, last night or today. Now, when they're bigger and in bigger cities, of course, the police is there. Now, I was watching the news yesterday evening and I saw that uh, the Minneapolis protests, you know, which were supposed to be you know, uh, the biggest, although I think they were a little bit bigger in Los Angeles, Chicago, and New York, but it's where, you know, uh, George Floyd was murdered. Mm -hmm. um, they were peaceful. I mean, there was nobody showing up with bricks and guns, you know, to fight police officers. And it was interesting that the police in Minneapolis, at least, uh, kept their distance away from the protest, mm -hmm. which was a wise move on their part because they're thinking, why would we get close if they're protesting police? That we would just escalate the problem, right? Now, as the evening went on, 
they police started showing up because um, curfew was enacted. So we had to be in our homes around 9 or 10 p.m., uh, depending. I think it was eight, as early as 8 p.m. in um, Los Angeles. Um, so, you know, when the police show up and we're protesting police, it escalates it, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, you know, you wonder if they didn't show up, would there be any problems? You really wonder, because it's only when they show up do people start destroying things and throwing things and, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that's been kind of the overall um, response by the police. It's been keep your distance at some times and, you know, engage them, you know, charge them. As happened last night in Brooklyn, I saw um, in parts of Los Angeles, um, uh, Minneapolis, even the, the liberal bourgeois media like CNN and yeah. MSNBC, they've been attacked by police. It's on TV. It's like, what are you doing? You're, you know, the, mm -hmm. the police institution defends and protects and serves the capitalist system. Mm -hmm. But they don't care if bourgeois ge media gets in the way. They actually shot um, tear gas at some reporters last night from uh, MSNBC. Uh, one got shot with a rubber bullet. And mm -hmm. so no one's safe. No one's safe from this militarized police state. No one. Yeah, I think in militarized police is certainly um, how, how the normal person would characterize it. And, you know, even for us in Britain, um, seeing the, the amount of heavy weaponry essentially that police carry is quite striking and um, especially um, given I think it's brought a similar position in the United States where hospitals haven't been able to afford um, personal protective equipment um, during the COVID-19 crisis yet you have you know hyper militarized police um, but you'd also mentioned that uh, you know racists everywhere in America have been emboldened um, by the Trump presidency um, so how, in general terms, has uh, President Trump and his administration, uh, or perhaps regime, as you may want to characterize it, uh, how have they responded to the, the, the protest movement? Well, as I said, they just this morning uh, labeled everyone who's participating in this protest as, you know, a potential terrorist, you know, because it's an anti-fascist movement against, you know, the racist institution of police and the Trump administration, you know, because if you're against police, you have to be against the government, right, that, in a way. Um, so that was, um, you know, very striking for us and worrisome. But also last night was uh, when the National Guard was called in. So it wasn't just police officers charging people. It was, mil you know, soldiers in green, you know, camouflage uniform launching, you know, um, uh, smoke grenades, um, uh, tear gas, rubber bullets and such at people. In fact, I spoke to a comrade in Cleveland, Ohio, very, you know, prominent African-American leader in the party. She's also on the National Committee of the um, Communist Party, as I am. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, we were charged by National Guard. Um, mm -hmm. And that's also the case for Columbus, Ohio. I saw a video uh, last night. Columbus, Ohio is where I'm from originally. And there were tanks rolling down the road. And it's just like, what the heck? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even, um, I believe the National Guard uh, maced uh, an African-American, and she's a Democrat, she's a liberal uh, congresswoman, but she was present at the protest to stand in solidarity uh, with her people. She's African-American, she had her fist in the air, and she was maced. So it's like, who is safe here? Who is safe here? I don't, I'm not sure anyone is safe at this point, because if the National Guard, who in Trump is their, you know, commander-in-chief, is macing even, you know, Democratic, you know, um, leadership, um, it's, I don't know. I never thought this moment would come in our life. And so the, the Trump, re, Trump regime's um, re response to this has been an authoritarian crackdown on any dissenters, not just the anarchists and radical leftists, right? It's mm -hmm. even with elected officials, right, who are from corporate parties, like the Democrats, yeah. you know what I mean? So it's kind of scary to know um, what exactly Trump is capable of and mm -hmm. what exactly is happening out there, you know? Um, absolutely. I think um, even for those of us who are well aware of the, the body foreign policy of the United States abroad um, and, you know, maybe don't harbour any illusions about the, the nature of the capitalist state, um, the, the levels of violence and, and the brazenness um, ha has been surprising to an extent. Uh, and, you know, I think it'd be fair to say if these sorts of events were happening, uh, say, in China, Venezuela, Cuba, Vietnam, you can bet that uh, American uh, American leadership, the American government, would be um, calling for intervention, sanctions, and uh, boots on the ground. Uh, so you know, the the, the it can be no illusion, I suppose, in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. So, 
going forward, um, what do you expect the, the trajectory of the protest movement will be? How do you think uh, it will develop going forward? Well, I got to be honest, and first I'm going to speak from a personal perspective. Um, I remember the Trayvon Martin protests, and I remember the Michael Brown protests, you know, the guy with his arms. Up. And yeah. these all, in my memory, they only lasted about a weekend. You know what I mean? Uh, or And of course, there's always Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, protests here and there. But I see this going far beyond that. And I don't know if it's, again, a response to the fact that we were in lockdown for two months and we're bored and just ready to go outside and have fun. I don't know what it is. But this time, there's something different. There is something different about these protests. And the overall mentality that I've heard from people, not just in my organization, but in the wider movement, is we're going to keep it up. We're going to keep protesting. Um, until we get justice, when we until you know um, these cops are in jail, until the police force, you know the the institution of policing changes completely, we're going to keep it up. And I don't think it's just talk. Um, you know, college students and young workers. A lot of us are still on quarantine, and we're not going to work every day. And it's summertime, you know, so students are out of school. So we have time to protest, at least for the next three months. You know, I think in, at least in New York, we're supposed to be in lockdown. I've heard until the end of July. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible that it's just going to be mass protests again and again and again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and we are being heard. We're getting media attention, which doesn't always happen. Usually, I mean, mass protests usually get attention. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. So the trajectory, I think um, it's going to continue to grow. The movement will continue to grow. I can't tell you if every night the protests will be as big as they were last night, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but the movement's growing and I think we'll see some change. We'll see some kind of reform coming at least, if not immediately, uh, once Trump is defeated in November. I really think, I don't think Biden or any other liberal or progressive can be elected without uh, their constituency really um, holding them accountable for um, reforming the police. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this uh, context, what are the uh, Americas, uh, so the United States communists calling for? Um, what, what are the key demands um, the, the CPUSA and the YCLUSA are making in these circumstances? So our main demands, and it's really interesting because these have been our demands since probably our founding, you know, and it's interesting how we call this period we're living in. Some people call it late capitalism. We call it the socialist moment. And it's because it's really the first time in our history um, since the 1930s, you know, then we had McCarthyism and then the fall of the Soviet Union. It's the first time since those major events that socialism is something that people are working for. It's still not a majority, but it's a mass, it's becoming a mass movement. Part of it is because Bernie Sanders called himself a socialist, but ever since his campaign kind of collapsed, you know, he, he gave up um, in favor of Joe Biden, um, our party and our youth league have been growing very quickly because these young uh, radicals are looking for a revolutionary alternative. You know, it's not just social democratic reforms. They want revolution. And so, you know, the obvious alternative is coming to the Communist Party, to the Young Communist League. Um, and so that's really, you know, built our numbers up and enabled us to mobilize in the last couple uh, months in terms of uh, COVID-19, mutual aid, um, online events, you know, and such. Yeah. And then now with the, with the uh, George Floyd protests. And so our demands are um, pretty simple, really. And it's interesting that now the, the, the wider movement are demanding uh, similar things. But it's... Um, you know, an end to racism, right? Mm -hmm. So you take apart, you dismantle the uh, police system as it exists under, uh, under capitalism right now. You replace it with community defense forces, which are multiracial, not mostly white, right? In multiracial, multigender, multiethnic, you know, multisexuality, everything. Make them more diverse, make them community-based, right? Not militarized. Mm -hmm. And then that will provide uh, a basis for for a more democratic and um, you know progressive society, and so that's the first you know you have to stop the constant killings, right? Yeah. It will give us a little bit more air to breathe and really work for um, you know these kind of uh, reforms. And we see the fight against police violence as uh, part of the wider struggle, not only against capitalism but against the extreme right and the fascist danger, right? Because as I said. Uh, racists of all kinds, whether they be police officers, Ku Klux Klan members, neo-Nazis, they thrive under extreme right governments like the Trump administration, who I think people forget, but he ran his campaign on, I'm going to build a wall. 
and uh, no more immigrants, right? And I'm gonna ban Muslims. He ran on racism, right? It's not just he's a conservative guy, you know. Um, like I understand the conservative party in Britain has an LGBT wing. That would not fly here. That would just not, that's not how conservatives work here, right? And so um, we see these fights as intertwined. We don't see them as two separate struggles, but one struggle. So um, we have to dismantle this racist system we live in and uh, defeat the extreme right. And that will provide us better ground to fight the struggle for socialism on. Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, fascinating to hear. Um, I'll just um, uh, assure you and all, all the viewers that uh, the Conservative Party's uh, LGBT wing is uh, just an example of window dressing uh, and they're anything but uh, committed to LGBT rights, but uh, a good tactical move on their part, I'm sure. So you mentioned the 2020 elections coming up. Uh, obviously, that'll be Biden facing off against Trump. Um, obviously, you would mentioned that will be significant for the Communist Party USA, YCL, and your own struggles. Um, what else is on the horizon for the communist movement in the United States? And, and what, what else do you have planned for the, the months and years to come? Well, it's not just that, you know, we're working to unseat Trump, right? Uh, we're working to build a mass movement for socialism. And we don't do that through the Democratic Party, of course. But uh, we do see the electoral struggle as a way to unite working people um, around um, issues, right, instead of candidates. It's not a competition between Biden and Trump, right? There's two parties here. There's many small third parties, like ours included, right? We have to be fair. Uh, but we cannot win under the, the system that exists right now. We have something called the Electoral College, which, as you know, um, in 2016, Hillary Clinton, she actually won 3,000, 3 million, I'm sorry, 3 million more votes than uh, Trump. And she did not win the presidency because we have something called the Electoral College, which determines, you know, who wins. And it's supposed to be more democratic or whatever you may call it. But that's how they determine who, who gets the presidency. Um, and so, you know, third parties don't get TV time and such. So what we're really fighting for is working class unity around issues. We tell them, don't go vote based on the president's personality and the you know issues that they, they that they you know of course biden has flaws of course biden's a you know a racist and has horrible foreign policy and could definitely increase and improve his uh, policies on uh, climate change mm -hmm. and everything right but 40 percent of our population doesn't vote 40 percent, and it's mostly people of color it's mostly descendants, um, not descendants, but so much, but uh, like immigrants, you know, uh, first generation, second generation immigrant families, right? And uh, some people who are just apolitical, they think politics don't affect them. And so we really try to mobilize those people. It's not that we're telling, you know, your average Republican, you know, oh, you know, don't be a Nazi. We're trying to get people involved who don't understand the bourgeois democracy they live in, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we constantly provide these voter registration booths not because we want them to vote for a bourgeois party, but because that initiates the conversation about socialism. Yeah. First, you have to get them to understand the bourgeois democracy they live in. Mm -hmm. Due to problems such as voter suppression and then the lack of information in the media, a lot of people don't understand the, um, the, their own government, right? And so mm -hmm. the first step is getting them involved in that first, right? And yeah. then once you get them involved and you bring them into socialism and you bring them in uh, to our uh, monthly classes that we host, we call them the Marxist, Marxist classes. Mm -hmm. It really opens a door to not just bringing people into the party, but to building the movement. There has to be a mass movement for socialism. And so that's what we're fighting for. And you know, right now in what we call the socialist moment, it's defeating Trump immediately, but uniting workers around issues in an effort to kind of lay the foundations for a socialist society. Absolutely um, fascinating to hear um, about, you know, the struggles that you're undertaking. Um, and I think from a personal perspective, you know, it's always empowering to speak to other young communists, regardless of where they are, um, but especially those who are also struggling uh, in a major imperialist centre, like the United States or Britain. And so, you know, it goes without saying we wish you luck um, in all of your struggles, um, and we'd send solidarity from Britain to all of those American workers, those US workers, are facing down the, the American US police state. Um, thanks very much to you, Michael, for your time. Uh, thanks to all the viewers for tuning in to this episode of Challenge TV. Uh, don't forget to like, comment, and share.